Hello, dear ones, and greetings from the Center for Contemporary Mysticism in Philadelphia. My name is Joe Irwin, and it's a joy to gather with you again to explore this amazing journey that we share. Today is a very special day for us because we get to welcome back Dr. Eben Alexander, who was our very first guest 10 years ago when we had the first meeting under the name Center for Contemporary Mysticism. And I remember, and I'm sure Eben does, and a few others who were there at the beginning, how we got together in the rectory of St. Paul's Church, where it started, and did a little brainstorming together, and uh, wanted to talk about how might we start a center where we invite people who have unusual stories and life's journey to look more deeply into the spiritual and mystical dimensions in life. And I know Eben was very helpful and encouraging to us. So welcome back, Eben. It's really uh, we're so grateful and enjoy that you've taken time to be with us again on our 10th anniversary. Well, Joe and Patricia, thank you so much for having me back on. And yes, I have very fond memories of those kind of planning sessions. And uh, I'm very pleased to see how much progress you all have made. You've done uh, some great work uh, interviewing people and kind of building up a repository of uh, information to help people who are interested in uh, mysticism in the modern uh, contemporary setting. So well, thank great you. to be back. We're looking forward to a great dialogue and interview here. We'll take just a moment and do a little housekeeping. While many of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Alexander's story of his initial encounter uh, back in 2008, um, when he had that amazing uh, near-death experience and uh, the week-long coma and nearly died from bacterial meningitis and how it changed everything that he knew in his, about life and his brain and mind and consciousness. Today, we're going to focus a little bit on the next step in his journey and what he's been up to in the decade or so since then. And it uh, is fascinating me. I've kind of followed his, his journey since he was a, a good part of our start. And uh, we see that he's been involved in all sorts of research and in exploring deeper realms of consciousness and has led him to become a leader in the emerging new science of acknowledging that consciousness is possibly the primary essence of the universe. So that's very exciting, and I'm looking forward to the interview and the dialogue today. And also, as we mentioned, um, there will be a Q&A afterwards. Now, I also want to introduce, if you haven't gotten to know her, our interviewer extraordinaire, Patricia Pierce. She's an author, a former pastor, a spiritual teacher, and a host of the We Awakening podcast, and she also leads a number of companion groups for those who want to participate in the global awakening today. So again, remember uh, to check out our website. It's simply contemporarymysticism.org, and you'll find hundreds of uh, videos of our past speakers. You'll find groups in which you may participate. We have a spiritual sharing circle, a spiritual readers group, meditation groups, and all sorts of things. And I say, remember that it's our goal to be a partner with you in your spiritual journey so that everything we do is there to help you in your journey. So if you like what we're doing, you feel it's important, we invite you to get involved, you know, join, uh, support, volunteer in whatever way you feel called to help us continue this amazing work. And again, one more reminder of the Q&A that will come after our interview. And uh, I encourage people, if you have a question or a thought, jot it down, because sometimes if you're like me, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, you, it's gone out of your head. So if you have a good question for Dr. Alexander or a thought you might like to share, jot it down. And then when we come to the Q&A, you have to click the raise your hand button and we can bring you on so you can dialogue directly one on one with Eben or with Patricia. So keep track of that. And now, without further ado. Patricia and Evan, we'll turn it over to you, and I'll be back a little later for our Q&A. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Evan. I just want to reiterate what Joe uh, said, you know, our gratitude to you for coming back and joining us on this 10th anniversary. So for those who don't know your story, I imagine a lot of people watching this event know something of your story, but I want to just begin with what happened to you in 2008 and then take it forward and where that has taken you. So you, 
you were a neurosurgeon and you had in 2008, this sudden health crisis, which turned out to be bacterial meningitis. And you went into a coma for seven days, which typically would mean a death sentence, or at least uh, if someone came out of that significant brain damage and impaired abilities going forward. But you came out of it, you recovered, but what you experienced in that state, in that coma state, totally changed your paradigm and your life. So I don't want to take too much time in your NDE because I think a lot of people will know it, but briefly, what did that experience reveal to you about the nature of reality? Well, it's, uh, you know, I'd spent the first 54 years of my life honing a very conventional uh, scientific worldview. I'd taught neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School 15 years, thought I had some understanding of brain, mind, and consciousness. And as much as I wanted to believe what I'd heard in that Methodist church growing up in North Carolina, my father, uh, very influential in my life, had uh, he was very religious, but very spiritual more so. Uh, he was also very scientific. For him, there was never any conflict. But growing up in the 60s and 70s, like so many of that generation, I knew that science is the pathway to truth. Uh, and then I followed, uh, you know, in those many decades of work, um, I, I couldn't understand how consciousness could survive the death of brain and body. I subscribed to the conventional teaching that, uh, you know, the physical world is all that exists and the brain must somehow muster consciousness out of physical matter. But nobody had any idea how that worked. And that's why I look back on my near-death experience as such a gift. Uh, it came in November 10th, 2008, went deep into coma over about a three-hour time period, beginning with severe back pain and headache, but then unconsciousness and grand mal seizures. Uh, there's a misunderstanding in the, in the lay press that it was a medically induced coma. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it was a coma that was induced by the severe case of bacterial meningoencephalitis that involved all, all lobes of my brain. And the good news is not only is, uh, are the medical details presented in proof of heaven, but also there's a medical case report on my medical records written by three doctors not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. And that report came out in Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, September 2018. Uh, interesting thing, they made two big points affirming much of what I'd said in proof of heaven and in my presentations. First point was that the documented evidence of damage to my brain, especially the Glasgow Coma Scale, the neurologic exams, CT, MRI scans, lab values, showed a brain that could not have mustered any kind of dream or hallucination, much less the most profound, exotic, memorable, detailed, meaningful, and transformational set of events in my entire lifetime. And all that happened when, as these doctors pointed out, my brain was demonstrably offline. It was not active at all. So how could that have uh, occurred? How did I have the most profound, meaningful experience when my brain had uh, all the details meant, no, this brain is not capable of consciousness by modern tenets of neuroscience? And that was the real gift. Now, uh, another thing to point out, though, is the uh, one of the atypical features of my near-death experience was the amnesia. I had absolutely no knowledge of Evan Alexander's life, humans, Earth, this universe. I went in with an empty slate. <clears throat> and when I came out of it, uh, weeks later, my brain was very damaged. And uh, my kind of mentation in this, in this world was damaged, but that recovered quickly rapidly over hours, days, a few weeks, incredible recovery, far beyond the expectations of modern medicine. And that was the beginning of a very deep mystery was that recovery. That's the other main point they made in the case report is you can doubt everything you want about this story, but the medical details make it crystal clear that this recovery is unprecedented in the medical literature. Uh, and, and so we, we really have to pay attention when you have that kind of survival. And that's exactly what happened in other NDEs, like Anita Morjani and her stage four lymphoma that disappeared, uh, Dr. Mary C. Neal over 30 minute uh, warm water drowning, uh, kayaking and uh, profound near death experience or allowed her complete recovery. But anyway, in my experience, just very briefly, uh, it really had three main uh, phases. One was the earthworm eye view, a primitive course on responsive realm. It was kind of foreboding, uh, you know, 
dirty jello. Uh, uh, I describe it all in proof of heaven for people who want to know, but it, when I describe it in talks, people would often say, was that some kind of hell or purgatory? If I had just gone to the earthworm side view and come back to this world, I would have had a distressing or hellish NDE. But I went further, like most people do, 95% of NDEs get into the beautiful territory beyond. For me, uh, that was what I described as the Gateway Valley. It had tremendous Earth-like features, but everything was like a world of perfection, like uh, Plato's world of ideals in many ways. And I would say it's the world of ideals for the individual soul, because that uh, Gateway Valley, that's where we would come into presence of our higher soul, connect with souls of departed loved ones, go through life reviews, uh, and the life review, very important to point out, three main features of life reviews that have been associated with NDEs going back uh, at least 2,400 years. Uh, one is that they're more real than normal uh, experiences. Uh, two is that uh, it's like you're reliving, not just remembering. And the third and probably most important, and 74% of them, according to Bruce Grayson, is that uh, it's like you experience it from the perspective of others around you who were impacted by your thoughts and actions. So in other words, it shows us that the golden rule to treat others as we would like to be treated is written into the fabric of the universe. Um, and because of my amnesia, I could not have an Eben Alexander life review, but I witnessed life reviews and reincarnation in a very powerful form in some of the visions I had in the next level of travel. Now the Gateway Valley, so I said many Earth-like features, thou, millions of butterflies. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly. I never had any kind of awareness of my body, but I did witness many of the events going on in that completely timeless realm. That's important. Deep time or meta time. It doesn't go by Earth time. Uh, you know, it's not like a, a loved one who passes over has to wait 60 years of Earth time for you to pass over. Uh, for them, it's it's kind of in the same eternal moment. And that's a very important thing to get because it explains a lot of the apparent paradoxes and uh, kind of questions about reincarnation and about our soul journey. Now we're all in this together. But turns out that my next level beyond that Gateway Valley uh, was witnessing that the just as I had been ushered into that from the earth from my view by musical melody and, and music, vibration, frequency. And of course, music in that ideal realm is far beyond any music that we could hear with our ears. And we see things far beyond what we can see with the eyes. Uh, it's knowledge through identification becoming uh, great aspects of the scene. It's one of the reasons why these experiences are often described as ineffable. No words can describe them. Our words are good for Disney World, but not necessarily for this kind of journey. Uh, and for me, what happened is in that beautiful Gateway Valley, I had a spiritual messenger guide. Those who've read the book Proof of Heaven will realize how important she was many months later, four months after coma, when I received a picture in the mail. Uh, that really connected the dots for me. Uh, but that beautiful spiritual guide was important to me, but because of my adoption history, I really didn't recognize her in the midst of the NDE. Uh, and it was that recognition many months later that went, oh my God. And that's when I realized the whole thing seemed way too real to be real because it really happened. But the third phase of the journey that I haven't gotten into yet was that those angelic choirs that were fueling all the festivities, the souls between lives dancing in the beautiful flowered meadow down below and all the uh, sparkling waterfalls and the crystal blue pools, all of that beautiful spiritual world, I saw it all collapsing down. Uh, just as the material world had collapsed down, likewise, spiritual world and deep time collapsed down until I was truly into that realm of infinity and eternity, oneness with the God force. It showed me that that infinitely loving force that so many near-death experiencers describe is actually the very source of our conscious awareness. So we're never separate from that. Once we're aware of it and start developing that relationship through meditation, centering prayer, we can all come into this kind of higher knowing of connection with that infinitely loving force of the universe. And that is really the common denominator of near-death experiences as they've been described by people of all religious faiths, by agnostics, by uh, atheists who have had these same experiences. 90% of people over history who have these experiences come away believing uh, in, the, in a loving, uh, powerful, personal uh, uh, force, a deity, whatever you want to call it, but the force at the core of the universe 
is one of love. And we find that we're bound together through love. And that is a universal lesson of so many near-death experiences. And for me, I passed through these realms multiple times. I would get to that core, as I called it, which was the realm of pure oneness, uh, many lessons offered there. But then I would tumble back down to that earthworm eye view. And then by remembering the musical notes, the melody, that's what allowed me to go back up into the beautiful Gateway Valley, lovely guardian angel on the butterfly wing, who was so important. And her, her eternal message to me, which I think was uh, the main message I was to bring back to this world, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are, uh, you are cared for. Uh, and that message to me was so uh, affirming and validating, and it, it, it went with the fact that this seemed to be a spiritual home. I mean, it seems familiar when people get there. That's what's so amazing, is our souls recognize it. They have memory of it, because there is a process of program forgetting. Very important to understand that when we come into this world, many children have memories of past lives and between lives, but their natural processes that cover them over around age five or six. So most of us, as we get into our teens and adult years, don't have those memories of past lives. But when you really get into a deep dive study of consciousness in the modern era, you cannot ignore that incredible literature on, on reincarnation and how important it is for us to understand eternity of soul and that we're primarily spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe. Now, for me, uh, in this coma journey, so many lessons in that core realm, um, but ultimately, uh, I was always told going into the core, not by words, but pure conceptual flow. You're not here to stay. You'll be going back. We'll teach you many things. I didn't know what all that meant. I even came to believe that going back meant just going back to that earth where my view that I'd already shown I could easily emerge from by remembering the musical notes. But there came a time when I could no longer conjure up that, that wormhole or pathway up into higher dimensions. Uh, to say I was sad would be an understatement, but I also knew by that point that I could trust in the universe, that I would be taken care of. And that's when I witnessed thousands of beings going off into the distance, um, heads bowed, uh, uh, murmuring energy, and it was coming to me in a beautiful way that was reminiscent of the spiritual home sense that I got earlier in the journey. But now it was coming in this lowest realm from all these beings around me. And that's what I call power of prayer in my writings many weeks later. And then the final vision I had deep in the in, in this uh, NDE that was so important was of six faces. And they were faces of people who were there basically the last um, uh, 24 hours or so that I was in coma. They were physically in the ICU room. There was an exception to that. A uh, woman, Susan Wrenches, who had been a, a friend of mine going back to age 20 or 18 in college when we first met. Um, and she was a good friend of my uh, family and a close friend who was watching over me during coma. And they knew that she had done some channeling work to help people in coma and other illnesses uh, in healing them. And of course, if you'd asked me about channeling before my coma, I would have told you it's all nonsense. But she was there as fully as anyone else that was physically present in the ICU bed. So when I first saw them in the vision as I was emerging from coma, I didn't know who they were. But they were important because they marked the time and showed me that the vast majority of my coma experience had to happen between days one and four or one in five of a seven day coma. All that time is explained in the books, proof of heaven and uh, living in a mindful universe. Um, but at any rate, those faces were very important. Susan had channeled to me. And when in the next uh, day or two and waking up and I said, well, these are the people I saw uh, when I was coming out, I didn't recognize them in the moment, but a day and two later, I did. I knew who they were, of course. And uh, they said, well, Susan was never here. She was 120 miles away. And I said, well, distance is not an impediment in the spiritual realm. So it made perfect sense to me. But it was really the last face I saw of those six. That was a 10-year-old boy. Turns out uh, it was my son, Bond. Now, I didn't recognize him in the middle of the NDE. I had no idea who this being was. But it turns out that was Sunday morning, day seven of coma. The doctors had estimated I had a 10% uh, uh, chance of survival early in the week, but uh, down to 2% by the end of the week with no chance of recovery. They had protected Bond from the worst news during most of the week, but when he heard that, he knew things were much worse than he'd been told. He came running down the hallway, um, pulled open my eyelids, taped shut, lying there on my ventilator as I had been uh, for seven days. 
And one eye looking there, one eye over there, neither pupil working. Those of you in medicine know how bad that is. Anyway, I promise you, I didn't hear him with the ears, see him with the eyes, but somehow his message got all the way deep into those spiritual realms where I was in the process of leaving this physical body forever. And his pleading, I now knew everything mattered. I thought through this entire NDE, because of my amnesia, this can continue, cease, doesn't matter. Now it mattered because there was this deep sense of connection with this other soul, even though I didn't understand his words, didn't know who he was, but I could sense the connection we shared as souls. And that's what compelled me to come back to this world. And when I did, when I woke up on, in that ICU bed on day seven, I didn't even recognize my mother, my sisters, my sons at the bedside. I had no idea who these beings were. Initially, I was just very, uh, all I knew was where I'd just been. And I was trying to put it all together. And things came back very rapidly, literally hours, days. Language came back, childhood memories, et cetera. In fact, everything and more had come back by two months post coma. My memories were more complete than they had been before coma. And we explain a lot of that in Living in a Mindful Universe, how modern uh, neurosurgeons in many ways are showing that memories are not stored in the brain at all. And that leads into much more of the science of the 15 years since that time. I work with scientists around the world, uh, but we've made a tremendous amount of progress in coming to a deeper understanding of primacy of consciousness in the universe, the reality of the afterlife, the reality of um, reincarnation, that our souls are eternal, uh, the interconnectedness we share. There are tremendous lessons coming out of this modern science of consciousness. And I'm just very grateful uh, to have the opportunity to share some of what I have learned uh, with, uh, with your audience and certainly with the world at large. Yeah, thank you, Evan. What a what a beautiful and in-depth um, sharing you've given us. And this experience then of of being in this state of coma. And yes, I mean, I've I've interviewed others who've had very profound NDEs, and they've always remembered who they were in their in their lifetime, and they've remembered the relationships, and often that is what brings them back. Is they're they're knowing that they're needed by loved ones here. So your experience, you were in this, you were in this experience with no clue of who you were or in any any earthly memory at all, which is totally, I mean, I've I, that seems unique. Maybe there are others have had that. But um the things that really you impacted you going forward it seems is first of all experiencing this absolute unconditional love that is the source of all being of all existence that was one thing and the other thing as a neurosurgeon neuroscientist i mean i can only imagine how this would have blown your mind like in so many ways that if you had been trained to believe that the brain generates consciousness, and yet you know, as someone who knows about the brain, in the aftermath of this experience, you know that in the state your brain was in, there's no way it could have conjured this experience. So there was some way in which you were experiencing consciousness apart from any kind of mental activity. And in fact, it was the shutdown of mental activity that allowed you to, to have this experience. And I'd like to hear you talk about, um, well, so that, you know, that, that turned your paradigm on its head from a materialism outlook where matter is primary and the brain generates consciousness to really the inverse, that consciousness is primary. And in a sense, we could say consciousness generates the brain. Consciousness generates everything. Right. So um, that is such, you know, um, and I know that in, in science, you know, this transformation is happening with quantum physics and so on and so forth, recognizing the role of consciousness in the material world. I'd also love to hear you talk about in your book, uh, Living in a Mindful Universe, you talk about the supreme illusion 
And you talk about the brain, not as generating consciousness, but really functioning as a filter, more of like a filter. So I would love to hear you talk about uh, the supreme illusion, because when we are here on this plane, we often don't experience that unconditional love that is the core essence of who we are. So we are living in this illusory state where we're out of touch with that. And how the brain, uh, in a sense, maybe filters us from that expanded consciousness. So I'd love to hear your, your sharings on those things. Well, there's a tremendous amount of, to cover over that one fairly simple uh, question, but it really has to do with uh, how we look at the brain and consciousness. This is all about the mind-brain connection. And what one of the biggest lessons from quantum physics over the last hundred years has been is that there is no objective physical universe that exists out there independently of the observing mind. And it's a real kind of mind-bending set of concepts. And that's one of the reasons it's been so hard to unravel is if you approach it from materialism, it basically is an impossible challenge. Uh, there's no way you can put together models where conscious awareness, especially extended consciousness, because, um, you know, in our book, Living the Mind for Universe, we go into what we call consilience of... Um, of uh, many different fields that lead to the same prim primary concept of, of consciousness as being the original thing in the universe that generates all of emerging physical reality. Um, and I think uh, that is really kind of where the action is. Quantum physics get kicks it off strongly, uh, especially when you follow the last uh, four or five decades of work in quantum physics that has repeatedly shown uh, in more and more refined and powerful fashion, that entanglement is real. And in fact, that's what I love about the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. It went to three uh, people, American John Clauser, uh, uh, French uh, uh, Alain Aspect, and Austrian Anton Zeilinger, who all did much great work over decades, beginning in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, uh, showing that entanglement is absolutely real. And entanglement is... It, the Nobel Committee admitting that, giving a prize for that, uh, is really kind of the first hint that modern science is moving beyond our simplistic notions of space and time, uh, you know, Newtonian determinism, fully into the quantum reality um, that is very different from our Newtonian kind of uh, expectations. And that's where the power of mind and free will really come to the fore. Now, you were talking about the supreme illusion, and that is a very important concept. And again, uh, it's discussed in great detail in Chapter 5, The Primordial Mind Hypothesis, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, the one that I co-wrote with uh, my partner, Karen Newell. The supreme illusion is simply an observation of, some, of something that is a fact that's pretty much undeniable. And that is, although we, the brain and mind are beautiful at convincing us that all that out there is out there, the reality is every bit of what you're experiencing is a mental model within mind. And I cannot state that strongly enough, but given the setting of the of quantum physics showing us there is not an objective physical world out there as it appears to be, but that every bit of it depends on the mental layer of the universe. That's where we start to realize how things like afterlife reincarnation uh, are absolutely real effects. So then it comes down to how do you explain the mechanism? How do you explain the brain as a filter, as a transceiver? Uh, you know, that concept, filter theory, um, is an old one. It comes from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, William James, who was the head of psychology at Harvard, a very renowned uh, scholar uh, in psychology, uh, he studied a lot of spiritual experiences in people. Uh, and for him, filter theory was a very natural way to look at it, that the brain just allowed a form of, of universal consciousness to be expressed as these little eddy currents of apparent individual consciousness in us as individuals. Um, and I think that's where uh, current models are gaining the greatest success in trying to explain this, is uh, some version of filter transceiver theory that really looks at all of emergent reality as something that is only, uh, that's mainly dominated by uh, those rules of consciousness. 
that allow us to uh, experience what we do. And now the consilience part of it is very important. And that is where we take things like neuroscience, the hard problem of consciousness that was first formally proposed by Australian philosopher David Chalmers in his 1996 book, The Conscious Mind. It's really an impossible problem for materialists. Uh, they, they first of all try and deny all the evidence and say it's not real. Like they would say, uh, Alexander had a hallucination or he's making it all up or something. But they cannot accept the reality of what to be was a brute force reality. I have to explain it. And to find that millions of other people have had similar experiences, I realized we have to explain this as humans because it tells us a lot about who we are in the nature of reality. Uh, but this is where I would say we're making tremendous progress. Uh, and as an example, I would suggest for your viewing uh, public to go to uh, bigelowinstitute.org. There was a contest held in 2021 by Robert Bigelow, and uh, he had lost his wife, his son had committed suicide, he had some money to put up for prizes, and he challenged scientific community, what's the best uh, scientific evidence for continuity of consciousness beyond permanent bodily death? Uh, and in that setting, they received more than a thousand inquiries. They demanded that you had to have at least five years of experience as a researcher uh, investigating uh, uh, these experiences. And of that, they got 204 essays. Uh, originally, they were going to give out three monetary prizes. The essays were so good and so convincing of the reality of the afterlife of reincarnation, uh, you know, mediumship of many psychic phenomena that they gave out 29 prizes. Those are all available, all essays available for free to the reading public at bigelowinstitute.org. Uh, Jeffrey Mishlov's first place essay is a great place to start. Uh, when you read that, you will realize uh, it's no longer a question of whether science uh, is in agreement uh, that these are possible, but in fact, science supports the reality of these kind of experiences. And this is a very important kind of step forward to help all of us come to deeper knowledge of this. And, uh, uh, you don't have to wait for the scientific community to get on board because through meditation, centering prayer, various ways of quieting the ego mind, the, you know, what uh, I love how Michael Singer calls that stream of thoughts in our head. And many people identify with that stream of thoughts as who they are. Michael Singer says, no, 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 that's your annoying roommate. Pay it no <laughs> mind. And that is a beautiful way of putting it. And what I found in meditation beginning about two years after my coma, and I, I'd read about 150 books over those first two years, really diving deep into physics, cosmology, quantum physics, uh, all kinds of spiritual uh, reports, uh, East and West going back millennia, et cetera. But I finally realized if you really wanna get this and you wanna understand your experience, you have to explore consciousness, meditation. Anybody out there who's trying to do this by reading, watching presentations, and thinking their way to the answer is not going to get there. You've really got to dive deep. That involves personal experience. That's why I love the work that I do with my partner, Karen Newell, who's the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics. Uh, and for people who want to learn more about that, I can highly recommend sacredacoustics.com, form of binaural beat brainwave entrainment. I've been using it daily for more than 11 years now. I use it to return to my NDE, not just to go recover memories, but to greatly enhance and cultivate my relationships with that infinitely loving God force and with the various guides and angels that I first encountered on my NDE. Those are available to all of us. Differential frequency brainwave entrainment is a very powerful way using simple audio signals of slightly different frequencies to the two ears to influence the lower brainstem and set your conscious awareness free. Uh, but these are all great gifts to the modern world to come to realize how we can bring tremendous healing and wholeness into our lives as individuals. And that's why I love your approach of contemporary mysticism, because that is actually the way into a much deeper understanding of the science of the, of the brain-mind connection and of the science of kind of human spirit and human interaction with the world at large. And we come to realize that the simplistic and paltry fiction of materialism that pretends to uh, say that the brain creates consciousness and that we're all completely isolated you know, individuals and our existence is birth to death and nothing more, that's all false. And that fiction really needs to be uh, dismissed because the much bigger picture that is emerging now and the scientific community is getting fully on board with this 
If you go to scientificandmedical.net or uh, galileocommission.org, Institute of Noetic Sciences at noetics.org or uh, Division of Perceptual Studies at UVA, uvadops.org. All of these are very rich resources of scientists around the world working on the brain-mind connection and the nature of kind of the human spirit and how all of this works. Uh, and we're, I, I, I promise you within five to 10 years, they will not be a self-respecting, scientifically-minded uh, a well-read person on earth who doubts the reality of the afterlife and of reincarnation. And we just need a much bigger understanding of how it all works. And from a scientific perspective, we're actually getting there as we outline in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And there are um, other books that uh, people can find on my website under the recommended reading list at evanalexander.com that will give you a tremendous amount more information to get into the modern science of consciousness that is supporting this beautiful reality of our uh, connection through the binding force of love and how it brings us into wholeness and healing. Yes, and um, I remember <laughs> a few decades ago when I was in seminary and one of my professors was talking about how science and spirituality are converging. And the interesting thing is that so many scientific uh, breakthroughs have pre been precipitated by intuitive knowings, uh, spontaneous insights, or dreams. Um, you know, Einstein, I, if I remember correctly, his theory of relativity came from a dream that he had. So there's always, you know, there has never been a separation, uh, but we've, you know, we've sort of bifurcated these two ways of knowing, but but it's totally artificial. Um, and I, I'm i glad you started to touch on the, the sound and the binaural beats because there are, as you mentioned, you know, what people I think really are longing for is the direct experience. It's not the ideas, it's not the information, it's, it's the direct knowing, it's the direct experience. And to move into that, as you say, we need to quiet the, the thinking mind, which keeps us in our own sort of bubble state. Um, and there are many ways to experience expanded states of consciousness. And people have been doing this throughout, you know, for centuries, um, you know, in theogens, um, shamanic drumming, uh, you know, going into trance states. One of the ways that you've been exploring is the meditation, um, binaural uh, recordings, which, as you say, it, it's a recording that has different frequencies of beats that are going into two sides of two, both ears, which can put the brain into like a, a delta state or, a, you know, these different states of consciousness. So... One of the things that I would love to hear you talk about is um, what you are discovering also about the role of the heart, consciousness and the heart, because this to me, and I know in my own experience, it's like the heart center is like the, like the, you know, like the portal or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it seems like this really is a frontier, of course, heart math is exploring this. And in your own experience, how have you been sort of tapping into the heart as a way of knowing, a center of knowing, and experiencing that as a portal to greater and expanded states of consciousness? Well, thank you so much for that absolutely beautiful question. Uh, you know, as the former Harvard neurosurgeon, I keep diving deep back, uh, you know, into my kind of scientific roots. And sometimes I get way too much in my head in talking about this. And I love how my partner, Karen Newell, uh, who I've been with for the last 11 years or so, uh, always reminds me it's about heart consciousness. And that is so true because for me in meditation, that's something I recognized very early on was kind of focusing on the heart and on love and on that kind of binding force of love as a force of wholeness and of healing and bringing us into oneness. Uh, that's been a tremendous gift. So this is never just about, you know, the head and the intellectual and the brain and blah, blah, blah. It's all about the wholeness of who we are as beings. And you cannot deny the power of emotional engagement in doing that. In fact, another thing that Karen would make very clear to you 
is in meditation. One of her uh, uh, best lessons is when you're, for example, if you want to connect with a loved one who has left the physical plane, someone who, is, um, who has died and you'd love to connect with their soul, uh, that go into that meditation or centering prayer feeling the emotional joy of success of what it was like to be with them. Feeling that in your heart is what opens up the meditation, opens the floodgates, allows the communication to happen. Uh, you can't deny the emotions. It kind of reminds me of a meeting. Uh, I participated in a scientific meeting in Paris about five years ago. And uh, there were several thousand people there and, and, and scientists up on the stage. And I remember one of them heard me talking about love and said, you know, we're, we're not trying to invent a new religion. We're trying to understand consciousness. I said, well, you really cannot grok consciousness at any kind of deep level without acknowledging that binding force of love that connects us all. That's the big, profound truth that near-death experiences for thousands of years have come back reporting. Gregory Shushan, who wrote, uh, I'm sorry, writes a lot about indigenous cultures and, and NDEs and, you know, going back thousands of years, all kinds of cultures, the most common feature is encountering souls of departed loved ones. Now, of course, the me before coma would have told you, oh, that's all wishful thinking, imagination. I now know that's the imprimatur, that's the stamp of reality. That means this is real. The, this person is is uh, actually engaged uh, very strongly with their soul, their eternal soul in the spiritual world. I mean, that happened to my own mother who passed, my adoptive mother, age 99 in April of 2019. Uh, she spent the last four days and nights of her life uh, deep unresponsive because of a pulmonary infection at 99 years old, that happens. Uh, and I remember hearing from the nurses, uh, I got there right before she died, but we heard a story when we got there that on the second night of those four nights before she died, uh, she actually woke up, got out of bed, which her nurse said would be impossible, awake, awakened the nurse and said, call my children, my mother's here, she's really here, call my kids now. And unfortunately, the nurse did not call us, I wish she had. But the reality is, when I heard that a day or so later, I knew it was really time to get there because she was going to be passing. Because that means it's a real experience. That is real. It's not imaginary. Um, and I, I, you know, to me, it's, it's kind of a fascinating reality, but it brings us down to our human level and that to find that that love and that emotional connection and caring for others, kindness, compassion, that these are so richly written into the fabric of the universe. Uh, and the universe is primarily mental and spiritual. It's not primarily physical. All the physical stuff emerges from uh, the mental and ultimately the spiritual. And for me, spiritual does not mean anything religious, although some religions can be very beautiful at in, uh, uh, energizing uh, spiritual experience, but oftentimes religious ideologies and practice is not. It's antithetical to some of the deepest spiritual nature. In fact, uh, Bruce Grayson and others who study NDEs will tell you that most near-death experiencers come back less religious, but more spiritual. Now, mm. I'm not saying anything derogatory about religions because when they do serve to uh, honor the power of love, compassion, kindness, acceptance, mercy, forgiveness, then religion is on the right track. It's following the message of the prophets. But as soon as a religion starts to be conflicting, uh, exclusive, eliminating others, warfare, et cetera, coming out of religion is an absolute, uh, 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 you know, it's wrong. <laughs> it's absolutely <Yeah. laughs> violates the original message of the, uh, of the prophets. And this is where I think the world needs to wake up. And that false sense of separation that comes from materialism that pretends your brain creates consciousness, birth to death, nothing more and does not acknowledge the connection that we know through things like telepathy, through power of prayer, through distance healing, um, you know, after death communications, deathbed visions, shared death experiences, which are just like near, near death, but often happen with a loved one who's perfectly healthy, maybe a thousand miles away. And in a shared death experience, uh, say their mother is dying and her soul comes through and grabs their soul, whisk them away into the spiritual realm, even to the point of seeing a full-blown life review before that bystander soul comes back to this world. Shared death experiences are a mind bender. 
uh, but they're very real. If you read The Glimpses of Eternity by Raymond Moody, that's where I was first introduced to the concept of shared death. And then William Peter, Shared Crossing Project in Santa Barbara. Google that, you'll find a tremendous amount of useful information in the modern era of, of shared death, which is just going to prove more and more the connectedness of souls and how we can each uh, in the modern era tend to cultivate a situation where we might accompany a loved one's soul. Uh, even to the point of life review, uh, and then coming back to this world. So the world is changing very dramatically in a positive direction that emphasizes the oneness, the connectedness, how we're all in this together. We really have to take care of each other. It's imperative. And not only that, but that false sense of separation has been horribly damaging. Uh, materialism, uh, the, the, the greed, corporate greed, addiction to fossil fuels, the things that result from caring only about me and not the others and not the world at large is horribly damaging. And that's why this awakening that we're talking about that I believe is absolutely imminent in the next decade or so, so that the whole world realizes the absolute truth of this connection of love and how we're all in this together. I think it is all unfolding very, very rapidly. Uh, and it's really none too soon because we're about to step over the edge of the abyss when it comes to climate change, our addiction to burning carbon-based fuels, biomass, and fossil fuels. It's all horribly damaging the planet, million species plus threatened with extinction. We really need to wake up. We've been asleep at the wheel under materialism. It is high time to wake up and uh, take proper stewardship of this planet. And this is what the spiritual awakening of oneness and connection is all about. Yeah, boy, I can just say amen to that. Um, and I, I also see that the, um, you know, the, the, the climate crisis is also precipitating and fueling this awakening because it's clear, like you say, time's up, time is up. And nature certainly um, exhibits the truth of interconnectedness and, and relationship interbeingness. One of the things I wanted to, before we, before we wrap up, I wanted to, um, bring to the fore the, I think sometimes people can have a concept of, oh, well, if somebody goes through the kind of experience that you've had, or, you know, any kind of an NDE or something, well, they come back and life is good and, you know, but there's work to be done. There's integration to be done. There's the healing of trauma and wounds that still has to be attended to. And so what in your view, and you talk about this in your book, Living in a Mindful Universe, you talk about um, the, the healing that you needed to undergo and some of the ways that you had been harboring these ideas of, you know, not being good enough or because you had been adopted and you couldn't, from the early stage, you, you couldn't understand that this was the loving action of your birth parents. So just very briefly, can you share with us what you have found most effective in healing some of those wounds um, so that you can release them and really live into the fullness of that love that you've come to know? Well, that that is a beautiful question because it really gets right at the heart of kind of my life my this unfolding and understanding uh and for those who haven't read proof of heaven or heard me talk before that is a huge part of my story my adoption i was my mother was 16 years old unwed um and although both my birth parents wanted to keep me there was no way that they could do that back in 1954 uh and social service has taken me uh you know, at age 11 days. My birth mother was really unwilling to sign the papers, though. She did, didn't want to necessarily put me up for adoption. She was uh, struggling to find any way to keep me, but it just wasn't going to work out. So finally, four months later, uh, you know, after I was in that baby dorm for all that time, she did sign the papers, putting me up for adoption. Now, I could not have been more fortunate. I was adopted into a wonderful, loving family of three sisters, one, the older one adopted, two younger sisters and biological children, my adoptive parents. My adoptive father was one of the greatest influences in my life, a globally renowned neurosurgeon, very scientific, knew a lot about physics, cosmology, but he had a very strong faith in God and power of prayer. To him, there was never any conflict whatsoever. Uh, and so he was a beautiful role model. Now, I remember he told me, you know, as a, a, an accomplished neurosurgeon, he says, you can't possibly remember 
any things that happened to you when you were just days and weeks or months old. Uh, and I, I believed him. But the reality is, especially uh, you know, later in my life uh, around these events, I came to realize that he wasn't, wasn't uh, right on that one. The, there was this kind of smoking crater at the core of my existence where I didn't believe I was worthy of love or worthy of existence. In fact, I was hospitalized at age 11 days. I think I was starting to sense some of the problems my parents were going to have with keeping me. I was hospitalized for a failure to thrive. I went on a hunger strike, essentially, trying to die. And uh, that's when I was uh, taken away by social services, et cetera. And um, so it did affect me very deeply, but at a subconscious level and something I wasn't aware of. But for much of my life, whether I was worthy of love was a very deep question in my psyche. And the answer was often no. I was given away by my birth mother. So no, I wasn't worthy of love. So you're exactly right. This what happens is through my life. And then especially getting into this uh, NDE experience and what all it involved, because it did involve uh, the fact that I met my birth parents. Um, you know, I first uh, kind of started getting clues about them uh, in the year 2000. All this is reported in the book, Proof of Heaven in Great Detail. So I won't retell it all here. But the interesting thing is uh, that they were out there. They got married. That was a giant shock. I never thought... I always thought I was looking for my birth mother, but I thought my birth father was just gone from the scene. Well, it turns out, no, they got married. They had three kids. And I found that out in 2000 and found out that, in fact, my youngest sister had, had died in 1998, two, two years before I even found out about her existence. And that one phone call for two minutes where I got all this information sent me into the dark, a dark night of the soul because at the end of the phone call, the social worker told me, that they were still grieving the loss of that daughter. So it was not a good time to come back in their lives. That really sent me into a tailspin. And if you read the adoption literature, you'll realize that if an adult adoptee gets another rejection by their birth mother later in life, it can really tip them over. That was in 2000. And many parts of my life really tipped over my career, my marriage, et cetera. Uh, I didn't recognize what the cause of it all was, but it became clear much later that all this was tied together. And I went through seven years after that, uh, dark night of the soul, quit taking my uh, sons to church or uh, believing in the power of prayer, saying prayers with them. That was all just gone from my world. Um, and then it was about a year before my coma when two of my sisters said, don't you think it's time you reached out to your birth family again? My first thought was no, because I remembered how that had kicked me into the abyss back in the year 2000. But they were right. They could sense there was still a hole within me that I was trying to fill. And it would only uh, be filled if I could really get some kind of resolution about that adoption issue. So I wrote another letter to the children's home. This time got a positive answer. And on October 5th, 2007, I walked down the sidewalk in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I hugged my birth uh, mother for the first time in 54 years. And, you know, minutes later, hugged my birth father. And then that weekend met my birth sister and brother and then extended family, all of it very beautiful. Um, and that was a, a very initial key step to the coma that came a year later. Uh, and the deep coma, of course, uh, involved that beautiful uh, angel, uh, guardian angel on the butterfly wing. But the important thing to point out is in many ways, we all have a separation from source. I mentioned earlier, uh, I think I did, the program forgetting that is what occurs in all these reincarnation cases, past life memories in children. And all of us uh, probably have some memories of past life between lives as young children, but those memories get covered over. Uh, and so for me, this was an extraordinary kind of reawakening of, of so much kind of knowledge of my bigger self, my extended soul beyond just the Evan Alexander of you know, birth to death in this, this lifetime. And all of us have that kind of wound of separation because we enter the material realm. And in many ways that uh, program forgetting kind of isolates us. I think it's for a purpose. It gives us skin in the game that at least at this stage, that being these few thousand years of human development is an important ingredient to have us buy in to these lifetimes. But we, we can now learn as spiritual beings that we're far greater than that. And that's why near-death experiences are there, spontaneous epiphanies. That's why this huge literature on these and the science emerging around them is such a gift to all of us. That is where humanity is growing into truly being 
wise. You know, Homo sapiens means wise. Uh, and when I look around, I can see a lot of wisdom in you know medical science and science of transportation, the science of communications, things like that. But I don't necessarily see big wisdom in when I look at the planet at large and what we've done with technology. And when I see that addiction to fossil fuels, when I see that horrific planetary warming that is going to make this a living hell in the next few decades if we don't change our ways, that's where I start to realize that uh, it's very important to have this huge awakening uh, of humanity to take greater responsibility for um, the all of us that are connected through that oneness. Well, thank you, Evan, so much. It's been just a delight to be in conversation with you. And um, I certainly wish you all the best as you proceed in this on this frontier of inquiry uh, about consciousness. And I look forward to seeing what, you know, what your next um, investigations might be. Uh, so at this point, I would like to invite Joe to come back on to help uh, out with, to lead the Q&A. And if anybody has a question, they can click the raise hand and Joe will bring them on uh, to uh, with video so they can interact live. Or if people want to, kind of be more anonymous, they can type a question in the Q&A and have it answered that way. So thank you again, Evan. I'm going to turn off my video and then uh, you too can have at it. Well, thank you, Patricia. Very beautiful talking with you. Nice talking with you. Thank you, Evan and Patricia, for that uh, really profound and insightful and hopeful conversation. Uh, so much you said resonated with me beyond all of the intellectual and scientific things we're coming to understand. It all goes back to the heart and remembering and experiencing when you were talking about if you wanted to be in touch with a loved one, maybe who had passed over, how you have to remember how it feels and uh, how it was to be with them. So few people realize that is directly out of Jesus' mouth. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, he says, when you pray, believe that you have already received it, and it will be yours. <laughs> and that's, that's saying exactly what you're saying. You've got to get in the mindset that it's already there. It's already happening. How does it feel? How do I experience? And, and that's the way it comes about. But it's so exciting to hear you talk, uh, talk about how we eventually have to use all of the other resources, but it comes down into the heart. Okay, I want, we want to leave some time for some uh, Q&A for some people. And uh, I see we've had one hand up for a while here from Janet. And so, Janet, we will ask you to come on board. Now, when you raise your hand and I click, you have to click on your little sign that says, join as panelist and start my video. And we'll bring Janet on to ask her question and unmute. Um, so... Your um, mention of there being no objective physical universe outside the perception of the observer reminded me of a place that I can find my mind starting to explode on the sort of Mobius strip question of, I know that I have had lots of direct experience where I've seen the impact of shifting my perception and my energy on things outside me. So the line between my perception and external and um, <laughs> in the nitty gritty is Donald Trump a figment of my imagination? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, just the, the whole question of if it's about my perception, I, I know there is one author who I read who basically said, everything I experience is my dream. How, how, do you, how do you think about that? Well, that, that actually is a very, very good question. It gets right at kind of the heart of our understanding of quantum physics and uh, the nature of reality. Um, but I would say uh, the important thing to understand, for example, we can look at John Archibald Wheeler, who was head of physics at Princeton. He was in the Manhattan Project a very renowned quantum physicist, he had to come up with something he called the participatory anthropic principle to explain the workings of kind of quantum physics and, and the observations. And that anthropic principle makes it crystal clear that mind is involved. That's the anthropic part. It's not our bodies. It's the mind. 
that is so involved and, and that's where free will comes into it and all of that. Now, he made a big point uh, of saying, yes, this is a form of idealism. Uh, and he compared himself to George Berkeley, the Irish theologian who had lived 200 years earlier. But it makes it very clear, or I, I would make it clear, that Berkeley had this notion of idealism, kind of like the question you're posing, where he said, well, I cannot know anything other that my mind exists. You know, I postulate other minds are out there and that they're real, but I can't really know that. I can only know my mind exists. And that leads us into a form of solipsism, which can really get very confusing and I don't think leads us towards much truth. But a different way of interpreting that idealism is uh, through looking at that primary, a uh, fundamental kind of God mind of consciousness that we all share. So I said earlier, to me, it was crystal clear from my deep dive in the core that that God force, that infinitely loving force was right at the core of conscious awareness, of my conscious awareness. It was the source of it. So none of us are ever very separate from that. But what it means is we're all individual eddy currents of that primordial mind uh, through a process of dissociation. Uh, and I would say a lot, of, um, a lot of this we go into in Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, I would point out that Bernardo Castrop, Castrop with a K, if you go to bernardocastrop.com, he's a, a major scientific endorser of our Living in a Mindful Universe, but he's written tremendous works on his own that really uh, uh, share this story more beautifully from the viewpoint of quantum physics, making it very clear that what emerges is a notion that each one of us seems to have the entire physical universe as our theater of operations. But the interesting thing is it, it's not true that that, that that one physical universe exists independently of us. So it's really on this kind of fine tuning of our understanding of filter theory and how these uh, eddy currents of the primordial mind get dissociated into an apparent individual identity. Uh, but then that all dissolves when we die, when we reunite with kind of higher soul. What happens, for example, in Anita Borjani's NDE at the same time that she's uh, mind melding with her brother who is uh, flying from uh, India to Hong Kong, presumably for her funeral, her mind overlaps his mind. She shares thoughts. She knows something in real time of what's happening. Similarly, at the same time in this experience, she's mind melding with her father who had departed the physical world. He's the one who informs her that um, her fear of cancer led to her cancer and that if she decides to come back to this world, the cancer will disappear. Point I'm making is that mental universe is something we have access to uh, as a sentient being, but it also includes access to souls that have left the physical plane. It's, it's all of us still inhabit that. And that is a world that is eternal, that's not locked into the flow of earth time. Uh, and that, that whole concept that I extrapolate on, um, on deep time or meta time is very important to get. That is, there's a reason why in those realms you can witness life reviews, birth, death, everything in between. It's all simultaneous to you from that perspective. It's a whole different temporal dimension. Uh, in the physics community, Bernard Carr has done beautiful work. He worked with uh, Stephen Hawking, very smart guy, and he's doing work on uh, hyperdimensional spaces and involved more than um, you know, our standard spatial dimensions and temporal dimensions. Very important because it explains so much about how that dominant force of love becomes so apparent in after death communications, deathbed visions, um, the reincarnation stories, etc., uh, is, is all kind of related uh, to that binding force of love and how we're all interconnected through that. And that that is the dominant influence. So we never have a paradox like, oh no, I'm worried my loved one has reincarnated before I get there. That cannot happen because of the dominance of this important of loving relationships at determining what happens in, in all these journeys, what happens in our experience here in the physical world, and also what happens to us in journeying through that mental realm and the spiritual realm in meditation and centering prayer. That's why it's time to jump into that adventure. Once you realize that your, you know, your consciousness is not just derived from a three and a half pound gelatinous mass, floating in a warm, dark bath between your ears, but that your consciousness is actually shared with the universe at large and with all other sentient beings across all time, then it starts to make much more sense. And be careful what you believe. I love what how uh, Shuren uh, Kierkegaard uh, 
said that there are two ways to be fooled. One is by believing something that's not true. The other is refusing to believe what is true. And therefore, I would uh, warn people that the predominant beliefs of our society in many ways are falsely constricting uh, compared to what is possible. So go into meditation and centering prayer with uh, your spiritual mind wide open to the possibilities. Believe in being able to accomplish it. That belief is what actually allows for so much to happen. And this is all, you know, there's a bigger discussion about placebo effect, spontaneous remissions, and then beyond that to miraculous healing and near-death experiences. That's all about the capabilities that human ha humans have in the spiritual world to influence their emerging reality in this world. So all of this is a kind of fascinating uh, territory for those interested in contemporary metaphysics. Thank you, Janet, for that question. Uh, Gary has his hand up. Uh, Gary, if you would uh, click on join as a panelist and uh, start your video, we'll bring you on to ask a question of Evan. <laughs> Be sure and click uh, start my video <laughs> and unmute. Okay, there we are. Now, can you hear me? We can hear you, can't see you. All right, here we are. There I am. There you go. Yeah, there I am. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Evan and uh, Joe, and hello, Patricia. So, um, you know, as you know, Evan, uh, one of the most famous people that went into this arena uh, that you experienced. Aldous Huxley, uh, through a different, a little different pathway, uh, said that uh, the, the brain is a great reducing valve. And so um, even I, I work with a lot of the neurologists and neurosurgeons and interventional neuroradiologists that you've worked with for many years uh, at Harvard and other places. And we look at stroke and we look at uh, how to treat stroke acutely and develop new treatments for stroke. And we're still locked into neurons and glial cells and plumbing. And I, and I think about what you went through and what uh, Anita Morjani went through and how you reset uh, your uh, physical self through this experience. And you know, in, in neurology, we're not even close to that, frankly, uh, from, from what I've seen and, and from around the world. Um, the question is, how do you evoke uh, an NDE, uh, and as, as Patricia said, you know, we need personal direct, direct personal experience. It's the only way. You can't read about it. Uh, you can try to use binaural beats, other ways, and to, to, to get there. There's no easy way to get there. You know, uh, people in, in Buddhism and Hinduism have been, you know, studying and, and meditating for 40 years, and they don't get there. The question is, how, how do we invoke that so that the world has a worldwide NDE and that we learn how to ch change our physical, uh, physical dimension in such a way that we become healthy, uh, not only individually, but on, a, uh, on an international global basis. Tim. Well, that is a, a beautiful question. Um, and I'll just give you an example of what we do. Karen and I, uh, for the last 11 years or so, I've been going around the world, uh, both virtually and physically, um, to uh, share meditation uh, play shops, as we call them. Uh, and uh, more recently, we've actually used uh, uh, the NDE scale, which is a 16-element scale with four categories of, of four kind of questions each uh, that address progressively uh, powerful and transcendental aspects of the NDE experience. And we use those in our workshops to help people who have never had a near-death experience through using binaural beat brainwave entrainment, which is a very powerful way of allowing conscious awareness to separate from the apparent here and now and sense of self. Uh, and people have had uh, tremendous benefits uh, in using that kind of guidance and kind of a belief system to uh, work with their own spiritual experiences. Uh, and it's really just kind of opening your mind to the possibilities, uh, certainly having a powerful technique of separating from that little annoying roommate, you know, your little uh, running stream of consciousness. Um, 
that is an important tool. And binaural beats are a very powerful way to do that. In fact, they, if you look at, uh, for example, Christopher Bache, B-A-C-H-E, he's written extensively on his high dose LSD work for spiritual journeying, but he wrote a beautiful book called uh, Dark Night, Early Dawn, I think about 20 years ago, where he actually compared head to head his work with high dose LSD work and Robert Monroe's work with binaural beat brainwave entrainment. And that was all based on a more primitive form of binaural beats available in the mid 1990s. I would say that uh, from my point of view, sacred acoustics is a far more powerful tool than what they had then. But even in that era, uh, he, uh, Bache uh, uh, was very, uh, you know, granting of uh, the power of the binaural beats is giving the same kinds of powerful information and life transforming information that he had received from the high dose LSD work. So I think it's important for people to understand that this is a very powerful technique. When you think about it, LSD is uh, for the most part affecting serotonin receptors in the neocortex. Uh, and, uh, and that's a very superficial way to influence consciousness. Binaural beats, on the other hand, go way down into the lower brainstem. And this is very important to get because any, uh, you know, any kind of auditory stimulus you've ever had, like a chant anthem hymn that might have engendered a deep state of conscience uh, transcendence, uh, those are all processed up in the acoustic lobes of, uh, in the temporal cortex in circuits that have basically evolved in the last two to three million years in primates and humans. Very different the circuits impacted by sacred acoustics and other forms of binaural beat brainwave entrainment. These are way down in the lower brainstem, circuits that arose more than 300 million years ago. There's a general principle in evolutionary biology that if you wanna get at understanding a function, and in this example of function would be consciousness, what you do is you look at the anatomy of the associated structure, brain and nervous system, you go back in evolution and kind of look at how it's evolved over time. And that explains a lot of how we work uh, by looking at how it all evolved. There's this uh, principle called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. All that means is when evolution um, or when an embryo develops from a single cell to a, a baby, uh, it goes through the same kind of stages as of evolution from single cell life up to humans. And what I'm trying to say with all this is that by affecting that ancient circuit, 300 million years old, that arose before we even had visual systems as animals, that was way back, and it still works. When I hear a sound behind my ear, that superior olivary nucleus is calculating the arrival time. And that's the circuit that we're oscillating and that's what gives you so much power for liberating conscious awareness. And you can only really get it if you try it and uh, listen through headphones. It can be a very powerful technique. Now it doesn't hit you the first time automatically, but for people who uh, learn more and more about this and start to use it on a regular basis, I use sacred acoustics every day. I've actually spent a few hours meditating before this session, uh, but it can have a tremendous impact. And I know from our workshops, that a lot of people have success at uh, basically kind of coming up with the same ingredients, not only of near-death experiences, but you would say shared death, and, and therefore after-death communications, this is what opens the channels. So many people end up having beautiful, uh, powerful, concrete connections with loved ones who have departed, things like that, connection with their past life memories, et cetera. This, by diving into this much a grander mental space, uh, with an open mind and not leading with that little ego mind. That's the important thing is you have to quiet the ego voice. And when I meditate, what I'll often do is I'll let my Evan Alexander ego voice state a request, ask a question, uh, an intention, what have you, but then it goes into timeout. And that's when I've learned to ride that uh, rhythm of the tones, of the sacred acoustics uh, tones. And that's where the real power comes in. So, uh, this is just one example, but what I'm saying is you can cultivate uh, these kinds of deep, powerful meditative practices uh, by using powerful tools. If you already have a great way of going in and silencing that voice of the ego, fine. But I know we've had several uh, people, uh, uh, TM practitioners, uh, Buddhist monks who might have meditated for 20 or 30 years who gain tremendous benefit by adding sacred acoustic spinal or beat brainwave entrainment to their meditative practice. So uh, it's not a, a fix-all, do-all for everyone, but it works for many and can be very, very powerful. 
So just to try and answer your question, I believe there are ways that we can cultivate these. Another kind of example it would be to follow my advice earlier for cultivating a shared crossing. Go to William Peters' website, Shared Crossing, uh, I think it's Project. Um, he's out in Santa Barbara. Look at a lot of the research he's done, some of his reporting. He's got a beautiful book called uh, uh, At Death's Door. It came out about three years ago, William Peters does. I highly recommend that book. It educates a lot of people about these kinds of uh, capabilities we have as humans uh, to cultivate, actively cultivate these kind of relationships and expand our mental experience so that it becomes much more richly integrated with uh, the soul of the universe, the mind of the universe. Thank you, Gary, for that stimulating question. I, I have one here from Mary. Uh, Mary, if you would click on join as a panelist. We will bring you on for another um, good question for Evan. So click on join as a panelist and start your video. And we will look for you. <laughs> Let me see if she got it. Mary, are you there with us? Sometimes there will be a, a little snafu. Okay, we don't seem to be able to connect with Mary. What about uh, Paula? Uh, are you there? And can you click on join as a panelist? There's Paula. Start, click on start your video and unmute and we'll uh, look forward to your question. Okay, hi, thanks for having me on. Um, Good. My question is actually a little bit different um, from what's coming forth, but it's about dreams. Now, on January the 8th of this year, my sweet husband made his transition. And since that time, um, I have had about just slightly under 20 dreams about him. And three of these appear to be not really dreams. And I just want to briefly describe them. In two of them, he appears to me in his spirit form. And he, he communicates with me not by language. He looked one and one of them, he looked me deeply in the eyes. And that was all there was to it. it I felt the love from him and that type of thing he appeared to to me to be glowing a, a very beautiful shade of gold and in the other one he also was in his spirit form and he um he also was gold again and j just held me this one was slightly different in that as he was holding me close i felt a pulse of energy in my heart area. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts about these, you know, the question is really, are they dreams or are they, are they something else? And there's a third dream that I had about, it had music in it. And it was the most beautiful, beautiful pastoral music that I have, I, I can't even describe it, it was so incredible. Right. So what are your thoughts on this, Dr. Alexander? That the dream space, I would say in general, is a doorway into the spiritual realm for a lot of our dreams. And we can use them for creativity, sources of insight from the universe, et cetera. But they are very commonly the mode by which loved ones who have left the physical world reconnect with us and demonstrate the concrete reality uh, of our ongoing connection. And, and I want to make it clear by concrete connection and ongoing reality. Uh, for example, there's a book by Larry Burke. He's a radiologist who wrote about premonitory dreams in breast cancer. Uh, and um, I know I've heard of, of uh, numerous examples where a loved one comes in a dream and, and suggests something to us about our health that then ends up kind of saving our life. So uh, I think of what you've experienced and what you've described is a beautiful example of very realistic ongoing connections of the soul of a loved one uh, with us here in the living. 
and they can be very informative. And so it's important to kind of cultivate that, nurture it, embrace it, uh, offer them the love back, you know, message received. Uh, but thank you for describing a, a beautiful uh, kind of set of examples, because I think what you're describing is a very authentic connection with a loved one in, in real time in the here and now, which of course uh, in that eternal reality uh, is even more impressive because uh, you're showing that you are also connected to that eternal spiritual realm uh, through having this kind of dream. But the fact that you've had them multiple times, I, I love that. And I would simply encourage you to go on and continue to embrace this connection that you have with, with him and uh, uh, you know enhance on it. I don't know how active a meditator you might be, but uh, uh, adopting a form of meditation is really a way of kind of lucid dreaming or taking much greater role in kind of willfully uh, uh, engaging with your dreams. And that's another way to really kind of expand our, our sense of connectedness. But uh, thank you for sharing that uh, beautiful experience you've had. Uh, and I would say that is just the imprimatur. That's the stamp of approval that says these are true uh, spiritual encounters that are not simply some psycho phenomenon that's different from a connection with your loved one. Thank you. We have a question from Elaine. Elaine, I wanted you to uh, click on join as panelist and see if you could come on and um, turn on your video and uh, share your question with uh, Dr. Alexander. Hello. Hello. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you all so much for, for uh, organizing this uh, very insightful and uh, even thank you so much for, for sharing and for, and for your, your work. Um, my question is also slightly different uh, in that it relates more to the uh, meta scientific aspect of this. And I'll start also by sharing a personal story uh, in a few seconds. Uh, this Egypt, I did a tour through, uh, uh, this January, I did a tour through Egypt, excuse me. So we sailed, did the whole Nile tour and then ended in Cairo. And uh, I had a, a guide there um, who took us through uh, the, the Great Pyramid. And um, the, during that, the whole day, we were asking questions about the pyramid and, and she was mentioning all the, this was built 5,000 years ago by Khufu II and 20 years and so on and so forth. And I have a very different vision of, uh, of uh, ancient history. I think we, ha are li we have a limited understanding. But long story short, at the end of the day, we became a little bit more you know, well acquainted and we sat down to have a coffee and we turned to her and said, sorry, but uh, these are not uh, tombstones. And she said, well, well no, uh, they're not. And I said, well, what do you think they are? And she said, well, I have no idea, but uh, they must be some kind of astral projection or perhaps an energy generating device. And I said, how do you know? She said, well, once I slept inside the pyramid with a group of mystics and this uh, cat-like uh, figure came out from the wall and I exchanged his information. It was the most transformative moment of my life. And then when we finally got to the question and I said, how old is it? And she said, we have absolutely no idea how old it is. <clears throat> Could be millions of years. She has a master's in Egyptology. And I said, then uh, the final question, final question was, why didn't you say all this before? And that's when it's when I think I had the greatest insight. She said, well, um, I have a daughter. She showed me the picture. She's five years old. I'm divorced. And uh, if I say any of this, <clears throat> I can lose my license as a scientist and I won't be able to work. And then you remember all the potential scientists that are out there, perhaps young minds that are super creative, but have this huge student debt that they want to, they have this career they have to manage. <clears throat> so my question relates to how do you see the creation of synergy, <clears throat> kind of this regrouping and this creation of perhaps a common framework to build up this collaborative development? Because uh, 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 in order to advance this new understanding, because uh, as you said, you know, we, we could be, well, another way to put it is kind of, we're wasting our time <laughs> in a way. You know, if there is an understanding of this, uh, this switch in paradigm of consciousness as primordial, and there are just so many further questions to ask of that. What are consciousness interfacing technologies? You know, when you go into the morphic fields, like Rupert Sheldrake, or the Akashic fields, right? as Irvin Laszlo talks a lot about this, you go into different uh, dreaming uh, and different communications with other beings, other entities. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? Edgar Mitchell's work at, at no, Noetic Science, uh, at, 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 at Eons also talks a lot about potential communication with other beings in other dimensions and so on and on and on. So my question is, um, do you see uh, or do you, do you feel the lack of a common collaborative uh, framework perhaps <clears throat> uh, in order to advance this collaboration and being able to 
um, build up, build upon. So each one can build upon. Sorry, I'm muted here. So, so, so j just, just to wrap up, um, I seem to be, be going into so many different uh, amazing work that's being done. And a question that comes to mind is, well, how do we kind of hone it in in order to, um, if, as a civilization, expand our, our state as a civilization and be able to grow and, and, and further this into new realms of, of discovering and understanding? <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. One minute, we got muted somehow. Wait a minute. <laughs> Evan, somehow we got muted, sorry. Oh. There you go. Sorry, uh, yes, Alan, thank you. Very, very good question. Um, well, what we're coming to realize is we live in a much bigger, more complex universe with a lot more kind of power and influence on it than our materialist uh, conventional thinking would tell us. And there are, in fact, a number of scientific groups around the wor world that I work with that are doing exactly what you're talking about, uh, bringing science and spirituality together. And it has certain practical implications. For example, uh, Stefan Schwartz of the Schwartz Report has done beautiful work in using remote viewing, uh, you know, a technique of information acquisition across space and time beyond our normal channels. He's used it in archaeology and archaeological digs. Uh, and uh, to great practical uh, import. And so by awakening to this and, and learning that things like remote viewing are real, I mean, our intelligence community, uh, you know, in the US and Russia and Israel and other countries has used remote viewing. Uh, it's been scientifically validated, but this is all just a practical way of seeing there are systems of, our, of people interacting with information and with that huge information field, the Akashic record, a quantum hologram, depending on what you want to call it. Uh, but that information field is where uh, we learn to interact as sentient beings uh, and can glean a tremendous amount of insight into the deeper workings of the universe. So uh, if you're not familiar, for example, uh, with uh, the work of Ed Kelly uh, I, from the University of Virginia, I would say he has written three of probably the the most powerful scientific books examining uh, the primacy of consciousness uh, in very profound way. His books, Irreducible Mind in 2008, uh, Beyond Physicalism in 2015, and uh, Consciousness Unbound, uh, which I think came out in 2021. Uh, and th this trilogy of books, is it's deep. Uh, you got to really be into it, I promise you, because they also make excellent doorstops, but they're much better as a source of wisdom. But the scientific world is well along this pathway. And then you can go, for example, to galileocommission.org, uh, scientificandmedical.net. These are both excellent resources, groups that I've worked with and many other scientists around the world trying to come up to a deeper understanding and uh, kind of a worldview and a theoretical system that can fully accommodate all of this. I believe we're making tremendous progress. One thing that is certain, we will never go back to the dark uh, fiction of materialism that pretends that we're just mechanical beings, you know, uh, chemical reactions, electron fluxes, following the laws of, of physics, chemistry, biology with absolutely no free will. That's what the materialist model will tell you. I will tell you that is absolutely wrong. Quantum informed science of consciousness is awakening the entire scientific community, and that will include all of humanity to a much deeper and richer truth. Now, you know, because the universe is far more complex and interesting, um, that's not the universe's fault. Uh, that's, you know, our little presuppositions and materialist science has been woefully inadequate to explain the brain-mind connection, the nature of consciousness, of fundamental nature of reality, when you realize that none of us ex have ever experienced anything other than the inside of our own consciousness. So this is really a big and powerful um, set of efforts, but it must be that grand and that visionary to get anywhere because all of our prior efforts, especially from that very limited perspective of materialism has never gotten us any closer to answers. So uh, I think what you're stating is kind of an uh, observation of kind of the, uh, the, the uh, kind of mystery of the universe, the uh, degree to which uh, things are unknown, but that should not make them any less exciting to explore. Um, and, you know, the pathway of science up until this point 
has largely been to deny and debunk uh, these stories of spiritual realities. And yet, uh, you know, that's obviously not going to be a way towards truth. And if you really want to frustrate yourself as a scientist, you bury and deny evidence. Uh, you know, Carl Sagan made a big point about that, is that the last thing any true scientist should ever do is suppress evidence. And yet in the conventional um, community, in our modern scientific world, you've often seen suppression of evidence. For example, um, uh, John Wheeler, uh, you know, the uh, quantum physicist at Princeton, uh, participatory uh, anthropic principle, et cetera, he knew enough to kind of connect the dots, and yet he uh, made a false accusation against J.B. Ryan, who was the head of the Duke Paris Psychological Laboratory, uh, that he carried on for several years. Finally, Wheeler admitted that he didn't have any evidence that Ryan had uh, fabricated data, but he damaged his career tremendously. And in fact, Wheeler worked very hard to keep parapsychology out of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, which is one of the most advanced scientific organizations on in the world for general science. And why was Wheeler trying to keep parapsychology out of there when he was the one who came up with the anthropic principle that stated there's something about mind that is far beyond anything we can explain physically? So in other words, the world is finally and slowly waking up and moving beyond uh, the nonsense of materialist uh, beliefs uh, into a world that's more complex, more real, more powerful, and allows our free will, when we realize how limiting some of our conventional societal beliefs are, allows our free will to start manifesting the world of our dreams. Uh, and that is where I'd say that this is going to be a tremendous advantage for the individual seeker, for the modern mystic, and absolutely for humanity at large. So uh, this awakening uh, is across the full spectrum of human engagement. Thank you, Alan, for that wonderful question. And I, we're getting near the end of our time together. I want to thank Eben and all of you who participated with wonderful stimulating questions and a lot more who had their hand up, but we just don't have time to get to everybody. I'm going to ask Patricia to come back on now, as we get near the end, there's one one thing I would like for you to reflect quickly on, if you would, Eben, and that is the fact that we've talked a lot about communicating with uh, deceased loved ones and those in the other realm, but there's a lot of what you get to in your book about the consciousness of the universe itself, and there are many great spiritual teachers and writers, such as David Spangler and different ones who really have brought to life the fact of even communicating with non-physical entities, such as nature divas and the rocks and trees around us and the actual uh, essence and presence of the world itself. And so aside from communicating with other individuals, uh, give us just a brief reflection on that notion that the universe itself and even the nature around us is conscious. Well, that is absolutely at the heart of, of where all this is going. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say the conclusion of those three books of Ed Kelly is something we could, uh, in a philosophical sense, label as uh, evolutionary panentheism. Basically, evolutionary because free will is truly active once you realize quantum physics uh, frees us up from the nonsense of thinking it's all just material par particles interacting, uh, but that there's a spiritual aspect that kind of leads the way. And uh, I think that is absolutely essential, the one mind hypothesis. If you go to that bigelowinstitute.org uh, webpage to read those 29 essays I mentioned, the second place winner is Pim Van Lommel. It's one of the most scientific papers in that collection. The other ones that are strong science would be Julie Weichel and Bernardo Castro. But in Pim Van Lommel's paper, at the very end, he's making the argument for the one mind, which is exactly what you're talking about. We share the mind of nature. The mind of the universe is all one mind, and we can explore every bit of that. And the resources that Dr. Van Lommel gives for that one mind hypothesis are especially Dr. Larry Dossey's excellent book entitled One Mind. I think it came out in uh, 2011 or so. Uh, and then he also mentions uh, the book uh, Spiritual Science by Steve Taylor. He mentions a paper by Bernardo Castrop in the Journal of Consciousness Studies that you can access on my website on evanalexander.com in the reading list. And that paper is from the Journal of Consciousness Studies in 2018. It's called The Universe in Consciousness. 
And then he, uh, Dr. Van Lommel also references the book Living in a Mindful Universe that Karen and I wrote as the fourth major resource on the one mind hypothesis. That's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and that's where this kind of work leads us. And I would also mention that Dr. Van Lommel's book, Consciousness Beyond Life, is an incredibly rich description of the modern science and spirituality around NDEs that help bring this to fruition. But every bit of this discussion is really looking at kind of the mind of the universe that we all share. Mm. Um, and uh, again, it's not in that solipsistic, uh, solipsistic sense uh, that we mentioned earlier of George Berkeley, like my mind is the only one out there, but really sharing the mind of the universe is a way of acknowledging how we're all as sentient beings contributing to the evolution of consciousness itself. Kind of along the lines of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, his beautiful book in the mid 20th century, The Phenomenon of Man, where he realized that evolution was much more than that discussion going on about Darwinian evolution in biological systems on earth. As a French paleontologist, that is someone with a scientific bent who has an interest in billion year timescales and a Jesuit priest, he had a spiritual training, but uh, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote this beautiful book where he exposed the reality of evolution of all consciousness, which is what I think is happening. This one mind, we're sharing the dream of the one mind in its process of evolution, of growing through the learning and teaching of sentient beings in the shared process of, of this beautiful life that we're gifted with to live. And that's why it's so important to take it more seriously and honor the sacred and divine nature of nature and of all of our fellow sentient beings, not just humans, uh, all of our uh, animal of, and plant friends and realize that that materialist paradigm is rapidly threatening more than a million species. And it is high time we woke up and uh, took, uh, took the steering wheel back and start uh, proper stewardship of this planet uh, towards love and compassion and kindness, acknowledging all the way that we are sharing one mind. Wow. Well, that is so wonderful, Evan. And I wanna thank you again, uh, both you and Patricia, and especially all of our guests who have come on and asked very wonderful, stimulating questions. Obviously, you can learn a lot more about Evan at his website, which is simply ebenalexander.com about his books, speaking engagements, projects. I noticed on there, Eben, about a 33-day journey into the heart of consciousness that you and Karen, is that something you're still doing? Absolutely. The, uh, if you go to ebenalexander.com, that's the first thing you see is that little um, banner wagging around and inviting your attention, 33-day journey. It was all Karen's idea. She's the brains behind this operation. But we started it back around when Living in a Mind for Universe came out as kind of a companion workbook. But the whole thing is completely free. Uh, it's um, um, now involves a community of more than 12,000 people wow. who have taken this course from around the world. And they leave their comments and they've helped each other. There's a whole community that's grown up around the 33-day journey. And it turns out all you have to do is leave your first name and an email address and you're off to a 33-day email drip campaign where each day for 33 days, you'll receive an email with a new concept, a new principle, a new idea from the book Living in Mindful Universe that we mention kind of briefly and give some example, often with some meditations involved uh, uh, and some instructions for how to do those meditations. But the whole thing is a beautiful gift to help people get on board with all of this. Uh, and that's just one resource. You can also go to uh, inner, I-N-N-E-R, sanctumcenter.com. Again, that was Karen's idea. It's a set of some, um, um, uh, some free, some not, uh, but uh, uh, avenues into greater knowledge. Interviews, for example, that we did uh, with some of the thought leaders worldwide on consciousness with other experiencers. We did that during the pandemic. There's a whole series of interviews for free available right there. They can explain a whole lot more of this from many different uh, uh, pioneering perspectives. Uh, so innersanctumcenter.com is an excellent resource. Sacredacoustics.com for those who want to start getting into meditation. She has beautiful training videos there. Uh, and also I would point out that innersanctumcenter.com uh, offers an entryway for a, a, a regular set of meetings that we have with people interested in this work uh, that's on an ongoing basis. And we love that because it allows us to engage personally with the community. 
Uh, so anybody who wants to join that and get up to speed on this and have a regular uh, way of communicating with us, uh, please go to intersanctumcenter.com. And that, that's how you get into all of that. But there are many resources. Uh, and on the evanalexander.com, just FAQ page, very important. Uh, the blog posting is important. My uh, 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 recommended reading list, as I said minutes ago, very important. And a lot of them have hot links to the scientific papers, et cetera. It's all categorized in that recommended reading. Uh, so a lot of tools to really help people get up to speed on all this. Great. That's a great, great resource. Well, thank you again so much. And I want to mention that you can learn more, too, about Patricia Pierce's work, her books, her We Awakening podcast, and the companion group she leads at her website, which is simply Patricia Pierce, spell P-E-A-R-C-E dot com. And lastly, remember, if you haven't done it, to check out our website at contemporarymysticism.org, where there are all sorts of programs and videos and speakers and Upcoming things that uh, you'll be seeing more about. I want to give you just a quick, uh, quick little glimpse. Um, this fall, our kickoff program for the fall, we're having a special panel to join us from that amazing community center and eco village in northern Scotland called Findhorn. They are celebrating some significant anniversaries and are one of the greatest, most amazing uh, organizations that for 40 and 50 years have worked with the sacredness of all creation. And so as Findhorn, and we have about five, uh, both uh, current and former members and residents and leaders there, Findhorn are gonna join with us in September. So keep that in mind, but you'll find all of that at contemporarymysticism.org. So I wanna thank you again for being with us, both uh, our wonderful guest, Evan and Patricia, and all of you who ask questions. And so until we meet again, we'll say, Stay safe, be well, and remember that you are perfect, just exactly as you are. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. And thank you all, all the questioners and to Joe and Patricia. Thanks for running such a great conference. Wonderful. Our pleasure. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll be together again soon.